So, you see what we need to do is to put down some advantages of a fire filter design by window. First, symmetry or asymmetry can be maintained. And therefore, linear phase or pseudo linear phase can therefore be maintained as well. Let me spend a minute explaining this once again, because it is a very important idea. What we are saying is that if you have a response h of n which is real and h n is equal to either plus h n or minus h n, h of minus n, I am sorry. There is either even symmetry or odd symmetry then the corresponding frequency response is of the form summation n going from minus capital N to plus capital N. Now, here I am assuming odd length, the same argument can be extended to even length h n e raised to the power minus j omega n and we can club. You see, we will take the plus and minus cases separately. So, we can club. So, take h n equal to h minus n. So, we can rewrite this as h omega is summation n going from 1 to n h n e raise to the power minus j omega n plus h minus n e raise to the power j omega n plus h of 0. By clubbing the plus and minus terms together. And of course, these are equal and therefore, we can rewrite this as h of 0 plus summation n going from 1 to capital N h n times 2 cos omega n. So, therefore, when you have a real and even impulse response as we expect the frequency response is also real and even. And this is called the pseudo magnitude. It is called the pseudo magnitude because if you now delay this impulse response by n samples to make the FIR filter causal, the only change that takes place in the frequency response is a factor of e raise to the power minus j omega times the delay and that only contributes a linear phase. So, you have a pseudo magnitude multiplied by a linear phase. Now, the only catch is that it is a pseudo magnitude, this is not quite the magnitude. In other words, it could be positive or negative. Now, wherever it is negative, you are also putting an additional phase of pi. So, you can call this resultant causal FIR filter, that is the FIR filter which has been obtained by delaying this by capital N samples as a pseudo linear phase filter, pseudo in the sense that it is linear phase to the extent of a, to, of a phase factor of pi. 
linear phase plus minus, I mean plus 0 or plus pi. So, it is called pseudo linear phase. And of course, a similar, in fact, this I leave to you as an exercise. Exercise, reason out what happens when h n is equal to minus h of minus n. Here you would find the pseudo magnitude has phase plus minus pi by 2. So, essentially what we call the pseudo magnitude in this case would have an additional factor of either plus j or minus j. And then of course, if you delay it again you have the linear phase term, but then here the pseudo the so called pseudo magnitude would have a phase of either plus 90 degrees or minus 90 degrees. So, this is what we mean by FIR filters allowing us linear phase. You know when you maintain symmetry or anti-symmetry in the response then you are guaranteed a pseudo magnitude or pseudo linear phase, pseudo magnitude plus linear phase or pseudo linear phase. So, it is the best, the closest to linear phase that we can get, that is what it means. Now, this is one of the advantages. The second advantage is that FIR filters are unconditionally stable. The impulse response is always absolutely summable. even in the presence of numerical inaccuracies. So, you see if the coefficients are real, when we realize the coefficients in finite precision, there is likely to be inaccuracy in the representation of the coefficient. But even in the presence of those inaccuracies, the stability of the filter is unaffected. Now, this is not the case with IIR filters. If the poles of the IIR filter happen to be close to the unit circle, and if there are numerical inaccuracies in realizing the coefficients, there is a possibility that the poles may migrate outside the unit circle in the presence of numerical inaccuracies. And then we have trouble in stability. Then of course, it does not remain a filter at all, because then you are not even, you know, you are not sure if the, now of course, I would still say it remains, maybe it is not correct to say that it does not remain a filter, it remains a filter, but then you have this trouble that you are not sure whether a bounded input can result in a bounded output or not. Incidentally, IR filters can never give you linear phase. And in fact, I pose this as a challenge to you. Show that IR filters which are causal can never give you linear phase. I believe I posed this challenge before, but I am just repeating the challenge again. I also give you a hint. The hint lies in showing that causality and symmetry cannot go together. Causality, symmetry and IR cannot all go together. Anyway, you see we have seen this universal principle of engineering and nothing comes for free. This is also true here. So, FIR filters seem to have everything that we would want them to. In fact, one more thing that they have is that there is at least a design approach for FIR filters which are non piecewise constant in the ideal response. So, we know how to for example, realize an approximation to the discrete time differentiator by using FIR filter. Simply find the ideal impulse response and truncate it or find the ideal impulse response and then window it. So, we know I mean at least one, one way to do it. We do not know how well that approach would work, but experience tells us that it at least works well. We have an approach, 
we do not have one for IIR filters at all. There is no way to design an IIR or there is no easy way to design an IIR discrete differentiate. I mean not definitely not based on the bilinear transform, because a bilinear transform is going to distort the frequency axis. So, it cannot be used for non piecewise constant responses. You see the if now when you reflect on the bilinear transform with the benefit of hindsight, you realize that the reason why the bilinear transform worked, even though it made a nonlinear distortion of the frequency axis, is that the bilinear transform in frequency was a monotonically increasing transform. So, as capital omega increased, small omega also increased, all the way from minus to plus infinity. So, as capital omega the analog frequency went from minus infinity to plus infinity, the discrete time frequency went from minus pi to pi. And therefore, pieces of the axis, contiguous pieces of the frequency axis map to corresponding similarly ordered contiguous pieces of the discrete frequency axis. Pieces went to pieces. And therefore, the bilinear transform in spite of the nonlinearity of the frequency transformation were, was employable for piecewise constant filter design. But it would not be applicable for designing a discrete time differentiator, because there even if you happen to design a very good analog band limited differentiator, when you transformed it with the bilinear transform, the frequency response would be completely distorted from linear. And therefore, we do not have a good, we, right now we do not have, we have not talked about any meaningful way to design discrete differentiators or similar such responses which are not piecewise constant in the IIR context. That is another reason again why IIR, why IFR filters are attractive. So, then where is the, where is the price that we are paying? The price and that is what we will now write. Price for all these advantages. The same specifications when realized with FIR filter designs demand more resources So, in fact, you would want to verify this when you carry out the design that you have been assigned. For the same magnitude specifications, when we realize it using the FIR filter, you would find typically that the FIR filter is much longer, it requires many more additions and delays. So, nothing comes for free. Anyway, so much so about the relative behavior of IIR and FIR filters. And now we have been talking about resources all this while, we must now actually come down to the issue of realizing filters. Now, there is one little thing before I go to realization that I would like to mention in the context of FIR filter design. You see, one might wonder why at all one should use a rectangular window when you have so many other windows to choose from. Of course, one argument is that the transition bandwidth is kind of the minimum. So, if transition bandwidth is the issue, then the rectangular window is a good choice. But more importantly, there is a fundamental other reason why the rectangular window is attractive. You see, when we talk about pass span and stop span tolerance all this while, what we have been talking about is what is called the L infinity tolerance or the maximum deviation. So, what I am saying is, when we put down the specs for a low pass filter for example, we said something like this, we said there is a pass span tolerance and there is a stop span tolerance meaning that the magnitude in the pass band must be within this shaded area and the magnitude in the stop band must be within the shaded area. However, we are saying nothing at all about the extent to which or how or the frequency with which 
this should deviate from the ideal in the past span and the stop span. So, it is quite possible that in the past span, it is only at one frequency that it really goes all the way up to the tolerance. Everywhere else, it might be far away from the tolerance, it might be close to the ideal. So, this is called the L infinity notion of error. Now, this L infinity is a strange word at the moment, but it will become clearer when we come to another notion of error called the L2 notion of error. The L2 notion would be the mean squared error or the sum squared error. And, and it will be very clear where the number 2 comes from. You see, the sum squared error. L2 error, as you might want to call it, is essentially the desired frequency response minus the actual frequency response. The absolute value of this is taken and integrated from minus pi to pi. And this is where the 2 comes from. The 2 comes from the square. So, when we talk about L2 error, what we are really talking about is the magnitude squared of the error as seen all over the pass band. You see, now also the actually, if you really want to understand the number, the why it is called L2, one should define the L2 error to be the square root of this integral of the error squared, mod error squared. But it does not matter. I mean, you know, if the, I mean, if the squared error is a maximum, so is the square root of it. You know, the square root is a monotonically increasing function. That is not such an issue. But, you know, if you do take the square root, then it does explain the infinity concept. So, if you were to take this, instead of 2, if you had 3 there, you would call it the L3 error. If you had 1 there, that means, if you took just the absolute value and integrated it, we call the L1 error. So, you could now conceive of the L infinity error. That means, you raise it to the power infinity notionally or to raise it to a larger and larger power, but then do not forget to take 1 by that power outside. So, raise it to the corresponding root also. So, if you are raising it to, if you are calculating the L10 error for example, you raise the mod error to the power 10, but then you take a 1 by 10th power outside. Now, you can visualize this being taken to infinity and then what really happens is that as you take it to infinity, it is only the maximum which survives, all the others you know are suppressed. That is why we call it, yes there is a question. Oh, so the question is would you consider the error only over the past band or everywhere? The answer is everywhere. So, you know, you have a desired response all over. Now, of course, you may argue what happens in the transition band. Well, you know, that is, of course, that is an important point here. The transition band actually does not have, an, have a desired response specified. Now, again, it is interesting, it does not matter. So, here, you could, for example, take the middle of the transition band as a point of separation. And you could take the response to be 1 up to the middle and then 0 after the middle in the case of a low pass filter for example and use that as a desired response. You could also if you wish take only the pass band and the stop band and put down an error here. That would also be a meaningful L2 error. Right? But the error is calculated all over the band from 0 to pi. Now, yes, there is a question. So, the question is how do you take the desired omega? The desired omega, the desired response is 1 in the pass band and 0 in the stop band. Yeah. Anyway, the, the point is the rectangular window actually minimizes the L2 error as well. So, in addition to the transition band being optimized with the rectangular window, if one is talking, you see the transition band is optimized, but the 
L infinity error is the worst for the rectangular window. However, the L2 error is the minimum. So, the rectangular window is not without advantages. So, you see that also tells us that L2 error minimization is not the same as L infinity error minimization. And that is not too difficult to understand. You see, it is quite possible that at one place, as I said, you may have the response deviating very far from the ideal. But it may be pretty close to the ideal in many other places, and therefore the L2 error could be low. On an average, the squared error could be low. But you know, because at one place it deviates very far, the L infinity error is significant. So that is about L infinity and L2 error. What I also try to illustrate here is that there is just not one notion of error. Though we have taken the L infinity error all the time in our discussion without having explicitly realized it all this while.